when you go through a worship set like that, uh, there should not be a, a shift to the sermon. There's just this continuation of, of praise about the sufficiency of our great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so may that be so as we get started here. My name's Tim. It's good to see some guests here today. Uh, we hope that you have a magnificent experience with God in this room today. And um, we're going to be in John chapter 3. If you have a Bible or a phone, you might uh, get there uh, so we can focus in on the Word together. Uh, we're going to focus on how the gospel continues to increase in our lives today. And when that happens, two things take place. One is that we uh, rely on self a whole lot less. Okay? And then secondly, that affects our relationships. Honestly, uh, as I kind of move around and I experience life with people, I get this growing sense that there's this great desire for relationships to be better, but people don't know how to do that. And so really, if you take, if you take discipleship and relationships and all those things and put them together, today may be a real uh, glorious day for you because we're going to give you some keys to how that really works. And so in your sermon notes there that you received a bulletin when you came in, it says the big idea is this, is that God grants us influence in people's lives. Some of you in this room are parents. Uh, we have some teachers in the room. We have uh, bosses. We have employees. We have family members, uh, all of those people are gifts for you to influence. But at some point, I want you to hear me carefully today because I'm going to say some things. You're going to get a shake in your head and going, I'm not sure about that dude. Once again, I'm not sure about that dude, right? At, at some point, there's a transition where our influence decreases so that the power of the gospel increases, people decrease their influence in your lives so that the power of the gospel may increase. And that's all of your relationships. That's what's going to sound a little weird to you today. Uh, hear me well this, though. The, the relationship does not decrease. The love does not decrease. Time may decrease as the kingdom expands, and dependency on people definitely decreases. Because as you become more Christ-like in your faith, the dependency on Christ goes up and it comes down on people. And that's a good thing because people don't make a very good God. See, because, because no matter how much you love somebody, how much you trust somebody, how much you want to build your life around a person, people are sinners and they will let you down. That's why we're all hurting in our relationships so bad out there. We're, we're asking people to be something that only God, only Christ can be. And so we set ourselves up for frustration. And so if Christ increases in my heart and my soul and my mind, I can relax with the people around me and love them well. Think about it. The Bible says that all conflict in our life, I want you to uh, go look at the book of James today if you, think I'm, if you question what I'm about to say here. It says that all conflict in our lives is because we are so focused on self that we murder people because we do not get what we want. It says all conflict in our lives comes from selfish sell fish desires. And the gospel wants to change that. The good news for you today is that the gospel wants to remove what we're requiring of people and set it all on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And so it makes love and peace, those things that we've been like writing songs about since the 60s, right? <laughs> Wait, everybody, oh, yeah. well, what would you like to see? I'd like to see world peace. What does that mean? We want to see love. We want to see uh, more evidence of God, and it makes that easier. You see, um, with every person in your life, you should be able to say, I deeply desire a relationship with you. I want to have a relationship with you, but I don't need to have a relationship with you. Because otherwise, if you're saying, I, I can't live without you, at some point, you might have to live without that person, and you're saying, God, you're not sufficient, and so you've relegated God to a position below that person. And so I, if I can view things that way, I don't have big murderous-like requirements for you. Like, if you don't supply this need for me, I'll kill you. <laughs> That's what James says we actually do. If you don't supply this need, and you look at all, every conflict in your life, that's the way it's rolling out. You are the person you're having a relationship with, the conflict with. You're requiring things of each other that only God can fulfill. 
So if I can see Christ as sufficient, I will stop killing you if I don't get what I need. That's all biblical counsel in relationships. It's all you ever need. And the good news is the smaller that we get, the greater Christ's glory becomes evident. That's why we were put here anyway. So let's roll this out in John 3 and see how it works. John 3 uh, verse 22 starts this way. And remember, we, Jesus has been with Nicodemus. He has explained how we are saved. It is regeneration, and I'll review that for you a little bit as we go along here. It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples, he has some new ones, went to, into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. So Jesus is hanging out with uh, these guys that he's called. They've all given up their lives just on his word. Come follow me. They throw their nets down, and they are now following him, and they're in the region where John the baptizer's hanging out. I don't call him John the Baptist, because otherwise you might, and some of you might think, you know, growing up in a Southern Baptist church, it basically killed you. So, John, but I'm a fan of the Southern Baptist church. John, all that's, because it's on video. John also was baptizing at Aenean near Selim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. So we have here is Jesus, the cousin I mean, I'm sorry, John, the cousin of Jesus, not the author of this book, right? Let's get the John straightened out. John, uh, the son of Zebedee, authored this book. This is John the baptizer. This is the one who was, was born, probably regenerated in Elizabeth's belly earlier in the Gospels. The cousin of Jesus, who is baptizing among, and he's kind of a weird cat, right? You know, he's got like, he wears weird clothes and he eats locust and honey. And, and I got news, these guys who are, are following him are not following him because he's like the cool guy to follow. Because he uh, is not very hip. They're following him because there's something there. I want you to remember that as this is happening, God has been silent for 400 years. It has been dark around the nation of Israel for 400 years. And there are some men like, uh, uh, you, got, you, you got cats who have been like just waiting for the Messiah, waiting for some light from God. And here's John the baptizer, and they like what they see. And so they're following him. But he keeps saying, I'm just the messenger of the one who is greater than me. I'm just the messenger of the one, capital O, that is to come. But there's obviously something great happening here among John because these disciples are just leaving their lives and following him as well. Let me continue in verse 25. It says, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Now, if you look at Facebook for 10 minutes, you'll see that there are all kinds of vain, ridiculous conversations going on all the time about religion, and that's what's going on here. They're baptizing in water, and some Jew walks up and goes, you guys are, what are you doing here? That's not how we purify. And he gets them into a, re a religious conversation that means nothing. Most of the conversations around churches out there mean nothing because they are vain conversations about religion like this one that takes place right here. Let us make our conversations about something that matters. And hopefully this day will be a conversation about something that matters. There's always religious jokers hanging around, trying to engage you, trying to distract you. The Bible warned, Paul wrote about that. He said, don't get involved in vain controversies. Don't get involved in controversies that do not matter. We are not in a political world. We will never have a president that's going to lead us to glory. There's only one who will lead us to glory. And we're going to focus on him today. And they, said, and they came to John and said to him, these guys who have been arguing, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing. And I want you to underline this in your Bible. And all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Now that's the deal right there. The earth is the Lord and all that's in it. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord and all that's in it. See, some of you still think that you have possessions and rights and stuff and that I've got my world and there's God's world and I'll let God into my world when I feel like letting God into my world. And, and John the Baptist just said, Quoting basically John, Psalm 24, a person cannot receive anything unless it's given to him from heaven. The earth is the Lord's and all in it. And see what 
we keep getting in conflicts because we keep fighting over his stuff. Always cracks me up when siblings fight over like their mom's property or something because you don't own that anyway. She didn't own it, you don't own it. You might, you might get to access a little bit of chunk of it and that is just to glorify the kingdom if it comes to you. We keep trying to steal his glory and it's a futile effort. That is a futile effort, one that will end in frustration, wrought with frustration. Scripture continues, says, you yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ. Remember, this is John speaking. But I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Man, we're going to see how this plays out in just a second, but that is just absolutely astonishing. John just basically said, as long as Jesus' name is made great, I don't care what happens to me for the rest of my life. Can you say that in this place today? Can you say that as long as Jesus Christ's name be made glorified, you don't care what happens to you for the rest of your life? That's the definition of a disciple of his, by the way. If you claim to be a disciple, there needs to be a growing awareness that you can make that statement. That's what he just said. And then he, here's the key. Here's, here's one of the most important verses, I think, in Scripture from John. He, in verse 30, he says, look at the must. Underline the must in your Bible. He must increase, but I must decrease. So here's the way I kind of view discipleship. It's on a sliding scale. Last week we mentioned that Jesus said that lest a man be born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so all of us are born into a world of self. The Bible is very clear that there's none of us good, no, not one, and we are born selfish, full of sin, full of evil. We're dead, blind, and evil. Nice way to view ourselves, right? Welcome, welcome to City on a Hill. Self. In the world of self is a world of darkness. God, God, uh, Jesus said that they, are, they do not believe in me because they love the darkness rather than the light. When we are self-absorbed, we love the world of darkness rather than the world of light. But at some point, if we are lucky, regeneration occurs and the Spirit comes and awakens us to our darkness. And we repent and we believe in Jesus and we begin to start to see some light in our life as we progress toward Christ. But some of you may have the experience that I have. We're, walking, we're going along here and on a Monday, the world does not go as the kingdom of Tim thinks it should and so all of a sudden the world gets real dark. In the midst of my salvation, in the midst of knowing God, in the midst of me being spirit-filled by God, there are these times across this timeline that there's remnants of the darkness. And so here's where God is taking us today, and this is all discipleship, is that as we can focus on Christ and worship him on a Monday, not just singing about him as, this, as these guys who led us really well just now, not just then, but on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, if we can worship and focus on Christ instead of, say it, self, it's hard to say even, isn't it? We'll find that the darkness begins to fade. That is the promise of the fullness of Christ is that if we see him as sufficient, he will be. If we feel him as sufficient, he will be. Because all darkness in your life comes from here. We think we love ourselves and we actually hate ourselves at the same time. Isn't that weird? It's like spiritual schizophrenia. <laughs> but here's what we'll start to see. What, what, here's what we'll start to see. What, what do we decrease? We decrease self and we increase Christ. That's what uh, John just told us. But we'll try and come back and plug it in, right? We'll try, we'll, we'll, tr we'll have days where we come back and plug in periods of darkness. Doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It means you're a human being. And Christ is not, you've not died and Christ has not come back yet. And so you're still a sinner saved by grace. I am too. And we feel it, but more Christ and less us should continue throughout our lives. So where do we decrease? Let me point out some ways here, and these are going to kind of be haphazard, and you'll have to put this together. 
They're in your notes there. We should decrease because people count on us less and on Christ more in the spirit. And if we can do that, relationships are still vibrant. As a matter of fact, it gets much easier to love. If we're not codependent on each other, not codependent on each other for needs, and we can rely on Christ, our relationships actually get easier instead of harder. This became very aware as we, as we got into having Conquering Addiction courses. You know, we've been a part of now of over 4,000 people taking Conquering Addiction, and we see all kinds of people addicted to all kinds of things. Maybe you think it's not you. Well, I guarantee you, if you don't think you're addicted to anything, you're addicted to yourself. Because we all have idolatry in our life, and we all have things that we count on other than Christ for our comfort, and all of those going to the level of, of, of addiction. But some people um, with strong addictions are kind of developed in the notion, especially if they've been to AA, that I must rely on a person to make connection, to be strong enough not to participate in this particular thing. And the truth is that they must cling to Christ. The truth is it doesn't matter how many times you call your sponsor. If you're relying on that sponsor rather than the power and authority of Christ, there's a really good chance you're gonna fall because you're still dabbling in the kingdom of darkness rather than the kingdom of light. And it happens to um, dudes fresh from, like fresh to the faith who, who have daddy issues, right? And this is getting more and more prevalent as we have more and more single moms in our culture. And it's not that the, those are terrible things, it's just that it's different. Because about half the guys that I meet now uh, would really like for me to kind of be their daddy. And there's, and there's all kinds of daddy issues out there. But here's the deal. At some point, the father, capital F, must be sufficient to where the one who's being discipled starts to disciple others. See, if everybody stays with daddy issues their whole life and viewing people as their daddy They'll never disciple another. They can't ever lead another. They can't be what they've been called to be, a disciple who makes disciples in the Great Commission. But the one who needed a daddy begins to daddy others by looking to the one who gained access to the daddy. Everybody catch that? I'll say that again because some of you are kind of slow. The one who needed a daddy begins to daddy others to look to the one who got us access to the capital D daddy. That's the gospel. And then a church leadership note. I don't know if you know this or not, but you don't get to heaven by going to a great church or by listening to every Matt Chandler podcast out there. That's not what gets you to heaven. You must deeply know the bridegroom. Notice John's language here. He's constantly pointing the bride to the bridegroom. Yes? And so what we must do, we must learn to engage scripture for ourselves to get to know the one we're married to. Everybody says, I want to know the one I'm married to. Well, that's fine if you have a spouse and you need to know them well, but you better know the bridegroom even better than them because that'll turn out better for them in the long run. And we've got to learn to read Scripture for ourselves to do that. And then as parents, now we're going to start meddling, see? Everybody goes, hey, you can talk about all that other stuff you want, but don't be talking about my kids. Your kids will not go to heaven because you pray for them. Helps. They'll not go to heaven because you took them to church. Helps. And they won't go to heaven because you led them toward the gospel. It's a good thing to get them in front of the gospel as much as possible. It's a good thing to pray for their salvation because it's a spiritual act by God on them, but they must worship the bridegroom for themselves. You've probably heard God doesn't have any grandchildren. He only has children. And then as a spouse, your spouse is commanded also to be a disciple maker. So his or her faith must develop for that to happen. There's probably a more powerful disciple in every house. That more powerful disciple's job is to make sure everybody else in that house is a disciple maker. That's their role. Not to control the house. So you control freaks out there who like everybody depending on you need to release the disciple makers. By the way... Um, We always talk about wants and needs, and you should want your spouse. You should not need your spouse to supply that which only God can supply. 
Because even your spouse doesn't make a very, very good God. As these things happen, we must humbly accept that God has all of these folks in the palm of his hand. He's in charge. This is his church, by the way. We are all but under shepherds of the great shepherd, and his name is Jesus. So if this is going to work, if this works, and this chart right here is all that you ever need. You are either at any given moment focused on self or focused on Christ. And so if you are focused on Christ, you can trust me that as he increases and you decrease, your life will get better. Maybe not your circumstances, but your life will get better. Because your life will be more full of life. Your light, your life will be more full of the spirit. You will thrive. And in relationships, that's not necessarily in terms of time or love, but just how deeply we engage as family. See, when I don't need a whole lot of things from you, I can engage you on a deep level. If I'm worried about what you're going to think and maybe that you might depart the relationship, if I say something that's tougher to you out of sheer love, then I'll never say it. You see, that relates to multiplication of the size of the church and church planting. You know, some of you are meeting in missional communities, and some of the people that you're meeting in missional communities right now, you won't be meeting with a year from now. And that's a good thing. You don't love them less. You, may, you love them the same. But you don't see them as much. Because there's other disciples to make. The church grows. It bears fruit, Colossians 1, 6 says. And then church planting. I miss some of the people that I've church planted with in the past. I love them the same, but I don't see them as much. We have family reunions. They're glorious. But we must grow up because churches grow and churches are planted and our relationships must evolve according to God's plan, not our plan. Otherwise, I'm full of, say it, can't say it, self. How about these guys who dropped their nets and just walked with Jesus? Some of them were married. You understand that, right? Some of them died having never had, having intimate relations with their wives again. It was worth it. Those wives, hopefully they're in the kingdom now, and they would say, it was worth it. How about John the Baptist? He was a great example for us, wasn't he? He was faithful. He did what he was told, and out of sheer love, he was obedient. Think about it. I'm sure he became good friends with his followers, right? He had guys who left their lives for him and, and, and left their relationships and, and laid everything down to be a part of his life. And now, if we just read the scripture correctly, those guys are walking over to another part of the river and hanging out with Jesus. And eventually, John is so a part of that little deal right there that he stands there alone. And then they come and arrest him. They put him in prison. And eventually at the whim of a teenage stripper, his head is removed. Now, I got to tell you that if, if anybody was ever going to receive like the prosperity gospel, it was this guy. And I just told you how life walks out for him. See, we're the bride. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens to us. What matters is that the name of the bridegroom is exalted. So John's job was to exalt the name of the bridegroom for a time and then decrease. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to be obedient to that? See, Jesus, John got some exaltation. I don't know if you've ever know, I don't know if you know this in scripture, but Jesus himself says, John is the greatest man ever born of a woman. That's pretty good exaltation. Jesus Christ himself, the king of all who is, the bridegroom himself says, this man, because of his love for me, I say is the greatest man ever born of a woman. If nobody ever pays attention to us again, are we okay being lost in the shadow of Jesus? Just being lost in his shadow. Here's the deal, we must be okay with that. Even if we go to prison while scoffers get rich, 
Isn't it funny that as, as some of the good men, some of the good women, the ones who really want to walk this thing out with Jesus, as our lives fall apart, as we see them get cancer, as we see difficulties abound around them, some scoffers out there look like their lives are great. They look like they're getting rich and they look like they're enjoying all that this world has to offer. But they're living right here. They're living right there. Even if we're killed as, all, as scoffers thrive, are we okay with that? John the Baptist had to have a few moments of darkness, sitting in prison, listening to them sharpen the axe, as the teenage stripper says, I want his head. But we were created for one reason, that's to make much of Jesus, make much of the name of Jesus. It's a single issue. It's a single issue. See, we try to make it multiple issues. That's the reason we feel so fragmented in our lives. It's the reason we feel so confused sometimes. So, and, it, and our lives are a single issue. How much are we making of the name of Jesus? See, um, this is not an equal opportunity marriage. The one, the, one that Jesus, the one that John is talking about here is not an equal opportunity marriage. You see, in our marriages, I see some marriages here in the room. You guys need to have co-equal exaltation. There should be just as much exaltation one to the other. The Bible says that we should submit to one another in reverence. But that's not true in the marriage of the Lamb. That's not true in your, your main marriage. Let me give you an example. On November the 5th, we're going to haul in a, like a big bucket of water here. We're going to put some people in and we're going to baptize them. And it's going to be really easy for us on that day to really focus on those people, right? This is a great day for them. They get, they get to exclaim that which has happened to them. They were once walking in the dark and now they're walking in the light. They were once blind and now can see. They were once dead and now they're alive. They were once full of sin and bound for hell and now they're free from sin and bound for heaven. That's something to celebrate, but we can't look at them and go, this is your day. This is the greatest day ever for you because it's really all about the bridegroom. The day is about exalting the name of Jesus above all others because without him, without the bridegroom, without his death that he sh should not have died and his resurrection, there is no baptism. There's nothing that matters. So he will be the centerpiece of what we talk about in that service or we're not a very good church. And yet we celebrate those people because the Bible says that even one sinner repent, the angels themselves in heaven throw a party. But I, I want you to recalibrate your thinking about that scripture. They are throwing a party in heaven because they're excited for that person, but the party is a worship celebration. That which they do all the time, this idea where they're exalting the king and they're worshiping the king gets ramped up. Are we ready for that? Here's my question for you today. Have we accepted that we, the bride, are not in charge? Have we accepted that there's death here, really, and life there? There's nothing in between. We as Americans love gray area, man. We love, we love to design some little smooth gray area. The only problem is, yeah, we're lawyers all over the place. Nothing, no insult, Erica. Right? There can only be one king. This marriage is not co exaltation. Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. In this room right now, you either believe that or you don't. He who is of this, the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. Just in case you didn't hear it the first time, let me repeat it, he says. And here's the deal, as Americans, you've heard me say this before, as independent folks, we struggle with authority. And I got news, you millennials out there, and you children of millennials, that's ramping up. That's not decreasing, that's ramping up. The struggle with authority. We as sinners born into self don't like authority, right? If we're, if we're born into self, 
We like to be our own gods. That's what got Eve into trouble in the garden. The serpent says, you can be your own god. We really want to be our own god. We really hate authority. And that's just a sign of darkness. That's just a sign that this is real. Are you catching a running theme here? Verse 32. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. So that's when you were regenerated. That's when the cross becomes real. Jesus says, um, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And you go, uh, yes, I'm in. I trust that. I trust that there is no other way. I am in. That says that this bears his seal now. That true belief and declaration, that's good news for you. For he whom God sent utters the word of God, words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Quite honestly, everything we're talking about here, if you haven't caught, caught anything else this day, learn this. It gets a whole lot easier when Jesus gets his proper place in our lives and in our minds and in our hearts. Jesus says, I'm all authority. I'm the final authority. This is my word. It has all authority. And then at the end of the day, you're either trusting that or you're not. When you're trusting that, it's Christ. And he increases and you decrease and light shows up. You remember me talking about the, you've heard me talk, some of you are new, so there was a pre-creation meeting. Before the Bible began, like Genesis 1, we know there was a meeting between the Trinity. And the Father said, to the Spirit, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Jesus, the third member of the Godhead, and we're going to exalt his name above every other name on the, uh, in the entire everything that we create. And everything that we create, and we're going to create a story that's going to make him the king and make him the hero of the story. And as he is exalted, we are all exalted. And we know that because all the Bible says that everything about the story points to Jesus. Jesus says, Luke 24, every word in this story is about Jesus. It's about his glory. And so our lives, if we are going to find light must be completely about Jesus because we have been the people that have been given to him to bring him glory. That was the love of the Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, but he also in the midst of giving his son, gave his son us. Here's your bride, bridegroom. Here's your people. See, that people want to feel good about themselves. How good does that feel? God the Father chose me before the foundations of the earth to hand to his son as a people for his own pleasure. To live with him forever and ever in light, not in dark. That feels like love to me. Feels a lot like love. And that all brings glory to the entire Godhead. Look at this, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. There's the pre-creation meaning. He, he loves the Son and he says, here, here's the whole universe. It's yours. Speak it into existence and then love it. And then at some point when they're idiots and they fall, you go be the hero of the whole thing. And so he came and he lived a sinless life, a life that we couldn't live. And he, and he died a death that we should have died. And he was raised again out of the tomb to defeat the things that we can't defeat. And that is good news for us, but it's better news for him because the whole thing brings him glory. Which is why the whole thing happened to begin with. So my question to you is, do you have him there? Do you have him in that position? God, through John, just said, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. That sounds like authority to me. Do you have him there? On this day, when you leave here, do you have him there? Is he the final authority in your life? It turns out good if he is. Because if you do, belief and obedience will follow. When you get Jesus in the proper place, belief and obedience 
will follow. Look at this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Good news? Would you prefer hell? It's good news. Let us be a singing, celebratory people because we, this is hell. This is heaven. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not, and he shifts a little bit, he says, does not obey the Son shall not see life. So there is something to our obedience bringing light. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, my free will abil ability is to bring darkness back in, trust in myself, and not obey. And therefore, I will not see life for a period of time. I don't lose my salvation, but I will not see life for a period of time. But the wrath of God remains on him. I implore you today, be humbled by the word of God. Be set into proper place by the word of God where Jesus is the final authority on all matters. This is his world. He owns it all. And we've been invited to play in his game and his story. Be humbled by that. Not, not, not destroyed by that, just humbled by that to, to where I, I set myself and I, and, I, and I say, okay, if that's true, God, then do what you will with me. And when you say, do what you will with me, you're believing. And God says that that comes with eternal life. That comes with eternal life. And then we follow with obedience. We become a disciple who makes disciple. And that belief and that obedience says it frees us from his wrath. That sounds healthy. Yes? That sounds healthy. So for your relationships and for you, if you're having a lack of health, I don't mean physical health, I mean just a lack of health in your spirit, in your mind, it's because probably we're hanging around trying to do something ourselves. Let's today trust the one who's a whole lot smarter than we are with all that we are.